Hello, welcome everybody. Hi. I hope you guys can clear can can hear me clearly, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's good. All right. I think we shall wait uh, one or two minutes before we can start our session, and for the viewers to enter. Okay, uh, Hi, our panels. Yep. Yes, Mr. Azari. And then Dr. Tim Barwell is here as well. Uh, our participants, uh, Hannah Bird is here. Jen Moore is here. And Ahnaf is here. Tim Kyron. Yes, Tim Kyron is here. Okay, I think uh, we can start now. Okay, uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are right now. So, uh, welcome to International Open Design uh, Colloquium 2021. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Isaac from University of Technology Malaysia. I'll be responsible for hosting the session today, and I'm glad to welcome our DMU panel, Dr. Tim Barwell. Uh, and also, please welcome our panel from UTM, Mr. Azari. Right? I also would like to welcome our participants from DMU, Hannah Bird, with the project titled Dystopia Land Use, uh, Jen Moore with the project title Reincarnation, State of Urbanicity. Also welcome our participants from UTM, Ting Kyron with the project title Bridging Klang River, and Ahnaf Samsri with the project title Parametric Office. And of course, not to be forgotten, uh, the viewers for this session, I believe we have guests from other architecture schools as well, not only from Malaysia, but also from the UK, India, and Thailand. I would like to bid a warm welcome to each and every one of you uh, thank you for joining and welcome to room number three. All right, for the viewers, uh, I will attach the link to attendance form uh, in the chat box throughout the session and also the link to our participants' work for this colloquium. Please take note for each presenter to make sure that your presentation is within 15 minutes and subsequently we're going to have a 20-minute Q&A session with the panels, basically five minutes maximum from our DMU panel and five minutes maximum from our UTM panel. Okay, uh, the sequence for the presentation today shall be as follow. Uh, we're going to start with Ting Kyron from UTM, and second presenter would be Hannah Bird from DMU. Third presenter would be uh, Anaf Samsuri from UTM, and finally we have our last presenter of the session, uh, Jan Moore. To the viewers, uh, should you have any question to ask during the presentation, please type in your question uh, on the Q&A chat box to the bottom right of the Webex window, and I may select uh, one or two questions to be answered by our presenters, depending on the time available. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I shall welcome our first presenter, uh, Ting Kyron. Are you ready, Ting Kyron? Um, yeah, I'm yeah, here. Okay, uh, okay. so uh, Ting Kyron with the project title uh, Bridging Klang River, which is an effort to revitalize Klang River from neglect and from becoming a dumping ground for domestic and commercial waste. Okay, Kyron, you may take the stage now. You may share your screen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. Yep. Okay. A very good morning and good afternoon, all. My name is Tim Kyron, uh, the final SEM student in UTM. My, and my thesis title is Bridging Sungai Klang. Uh, first and foremost, a brief introduction on the chosen site. The chosen site study, the, the chosen study site is in the capital city of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and is along a stretch of road called Jalampang. As for our master plan proposal, the stretch of Jalampang is divided into four zones, the transit entertainment, historical reclaiming, where the chosen site is located, the cultural exploration, and finally the sustainable tourism. The selected site is a 1.64 acres of empty flatland, with entry being from Jala Yang Kwan Singh and currently in use as a paid parking lot lease from DBKL, our local council. Uh, number one to eight is the building within a 150 meters radius of the site, with some parts of Kampong Baru within 150 meter radius, whereas nine to 20 is those within a 300 radius of the site. So this is the aerial perspective of the site with the surroundings building proximity map from the nearest in yellow to the furthest in pink. Next is the site perspective from uh, the Agne Highway. Unfortunately, due to the travel restriction, I'm able to obtain the actual site perspective. 
uh, as for the following chapter, I'll be explaining on the contextual studies for the chosen site. First is the Klan River itself. So in historically, the river once served as the only means of transportation into the inlands of Selangor, and also where settlements clustered along the river banks in the heyday of the tin mining industries. Uh, the 1879 maps shows the location of the tin mines and the 1895 map shows the settlements clustered along the Klang River. Next is the overall basin of the Klang River itself, with an approximate length of 120 km with a basin area of 1288 km square. The river starts from Kuala Sela, sorry, where the The river starts from Kuala Sela, where the Klang Gates Dam is located, and the, the river currently serves as a water supply for Selangor and also KL. The selected site is mapped in relation to the overall basin of the Klang River itself. Uh, next is the Klang River within the selected site vicinity. The site is approximately 45 meters above sea level, whereas the river is approximately 30 meters to 35 meters above sea level. The length is, cut, is approximately 400 meters with a width at 40 meters at the widest and 20 meters at the narrowest. The current condition of the river can be seen from perspective A. It's a natural non concrete with the drawbacks of ugly being on both sides of the river bank, blocking the river from the KL and Kampong Baru area. And the depth, depth of the river is suitable for small boats and swimming. Up next is the urban studies. The chosen site area has a fragmented urban fabric with much more open spaces uh, in white compared to the building mass in black, which causes the building in the city to be disconnected from one another. And this is the architectural context studies of the chosen site in a 300 meter radius. The most prominent would be the KLCC at the fringe of the circle. Next is the social aspects, where the demographic consists of mainly suits and urban residents with occasional tourists and youth. Across the Klang River in Kampung Baru, there's a mix of local elderly, their third generation, and also migrant workers. Finally, is the pedestrian movement of the selected site. Most of the movements are concentrated along Jalan Ampang and towards Saloma Ling, with a low and to moderate pedestrian movement along Jalan Yap Kwan Seng, where the entrance of the site is lo located. In this chapter, I will talk about the site issues in the form of architectural and urban. The first issue will be the lost spaces caused by the rapid development of KL. And in this context will be the construction of Agle that was built along Klang River, which causes most of the Klang River along the KL city area to be hidden from sight. The river bank of the past was gone and replaced with underutilized, abandoned and in dilapidated state spaces. The picture shows some of the lost spaces under Agle. As for the second issue is the physical segregation of KL city and Kampong Baru. Other than creating lost spaces, Akle also defines the ages of KL City and creates a physical barrier that separates Kampong Baru from the city in terms of connectivity and imageability. In the study area, there is only two vehicle connections and only one pedestrian connection, which is the Saloma link, within these two areas. And from the space syntax analysis of the actual line, it shows that Jalan Ampang and Jalan Yap Kwan Seng has a relative low connectivity and integration value compared to the other roads due to the limited connection. And in the fourth chapter, I will discuss on the ongoing initiative done by the local council and government. The first will be the Kampong Baru concept plan, where it is coined the 21st century Kampong Melayu with a direction to facilitate the development of Kampong Baru through pragmatic approach and aims to develop Kampong Baru into a catalyst for further development of KL city and at the same time, creating opportunities for the locals. And in, in, and in relation to the chosen site, the proposed development in the vicinity would be the Arts and Culture Centre on the Malay Heritage, housings, mixed developments, parks and also schools. It has a healthy mix of varied programmes that can be exploited further if paired correctly with counterparts in the KL site. Next is the River of Life Master Plan that aims to transform Klang River into a vibrant and livable waterfront with high economic values. This is the Phase 1 Master Plan with further at the Kampong Baru and Jalan Ampang Note. Unfortunately, the current phase one plan doesn't reach the chosen site. And finally, it's a companion to the River of Life Master Plan, which is the outreach program where it aims to foster partnership and improve attitudes and behavior to reduce pollution of the Klang River. 
The main goal is to improve the currency water index from class 4, which is for irrigation purposes, to class 2B, which is suitable for recreational use with body contact. And in chapter 5, we'll be on the design ideation behind the bridge, bridging Sungai plan concept. Um, the aim of this study is to study the potential and propose the site in conjunction with the Klang River as a social and physical integration bridge between KL City and Kampong Baru. And to achieve that, the three main objectives is to reclaim the leftover interstitial urban spaces under Arklay and to in reincorporate Sungai Klang into urban, the urban fabric and lastly to rekindle the connection between KL City and Kampong Baru. This is the proposed programs for the site with the primary program being the Klang River Science Centre. Secondary program would be the Riverfront and also a future program which I'll explain in the next two slides. First, we'll talk about the primary program, which is the Klang River River Science Centre. that aims to spread awareness of the, on the importance of the Klang River and also a micro F&B square that fosters integration of local foods, especially from Kampong Baru into hearts of the city and also a river century, a place to observe and take in the beauty of Klang River. As for, the, as for the future programs, the primary program can also become a continuation point after the completion of the River of Life Master Plan Phase 1 and also become a river water treatment centre that filters and cleans the Klang River, which also mitigate the floods that occur annually. And we move on to the secondary program, the River Front, which aims to revitalise the river banks of the Klang River and also bridge KL City and Kampong Baru for the pedestrian and the two-wheelers, which includes uh, bicycle and motorcycle. There will also be a linear park along the river that can be linked to the River of Life Phase 1 master plan and also an informal event area that can host weekly markets and also festival celebration. Uh, this is the general development data of the proposal with the program by diagram at the upper right corner and the parking calculation at the, on the bottom right. Uh, this is the client for the proposal, TPKL and PPKB, which is the company that is responsible for the development of the Kampong Baru and also as a stakeholder, and JPS and River of Light as the operator. In this part, I will explain the concept formation for the proposal. Number one shows the existing site that has the same platform level as Angle and is right on the edge of the city bounded by Arle and with the river inaccessible. Number two shows the removal of the barrier, which is the facade wall under Arle, between the site and also effectively the KL City area, the, the river and also Kampong Baru. Number three shows the creation of direct physical and visual access from Jalaya Kwan Singh to the Klang River. Next is a sloping on all sides of the site to create access from the river and vice versa. Five shows the placement of the building form parallel to the, build, to the river. Six shows the addition of height to the building form to provide ground level access. And seven shows the form alteration where the building is trimmed to return the direct access from Jalan Yang Kwan Seng, and the building is further altered in the X and Y axis. Eh, sorry. Number eight shows the proposed water tank tower that shows that stores the water of the river of the river which serve as a re visual reminder to the city masses on the current water condition of the Klang River. The water tower is situated visually convenient from all locations. And number nine is the formation of cascading ramps and landscape to continue, continue the existing riverbank landscape and create access into the building. Number 10 is the bridging of both sides with elevated pedestrian and two-wheelers bridges and also a pedestrian bridge that connects to the neighboring site. There will also be a above river level bridge to connect the site to Kampong Baru. And the building breaks the monotonous form of the city, but still inherits some of the interesting aspects of the surrounding building, such as the vertical elements of the Ang Bank Tower and the Australian High Commission. And this is the actual line comparison after the introduction of the bridges. It can be seen clearly that the new connection greatly increases the connectivity and integration value of Jalan Yakon Singh compared to the previous one. And finally, in the final chapter will be the design scheme. On the right shows the mini master plan where it aims to connect the city through the newly proposed pedestrian and bicycle path that includes the Saloma link and also into Kampong Baru through the proposed site. On the left is the drop-off perspective and on the right will be the view from Jalaya Kwan Seng. 
this is site plan proposal. The main access would, for the vehicle would be from the shared road from Jalan Saloma on the left with a branch out into Angle for exit. The shared roundabout is a direct and the shared roundabout directs and slows the traffic. The motorcycle bridge can be easily accessed from here. And number 13 is strictly for pedestrian and two wheelers, but in case of fire emergency, it can serve also as a fire access. Next up is the ground floor, uh, where the science center will be located, and also the street level access to the river. Then the lower ground where services will be, and also the parking. And the first and second floor, which is continuation for the science center. And this is exploded exonometry, which is separated into the side on the left and also on the right for the building parts. The perspective for the thoroughfare at the ground level on the left and also river science area on the right. The sections, the four, uh, the elevation, sorry. And their respective locations of the elevation shown at the upper right. And the sections, similar to the elevation, the, their respective cuts are shown at the upper right. And the sectional perspective. And finally, the area perspective. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Iron. Okay, uh, right now it's time for a Q&A session with the panel. Uh, may I have uh, Mr. Azari for comments and suggestions? Okay, hi, Ping Karen. Um, Hello. Sorry. All right. Um, uh, basically, I need to declare to all of you that uh, Ping Karen is currently under my supervision. So uh, I just spoke to him um, about what he should do for this semester just, I think, a few days ago. But I think one of the things that I want to recap for the benefit of uh, the audience here is that the importance uh, of bridging this gap of the river, or the, uh, this is what we call uh, Sungai Klang, uh, the river Klang. So basically, uh, what's happening in Kuala Lumpur is that on the uh, on the other side, what you can see here, the KLCC, uh, the huge towers, the metropolitan towers and all that, is happening on the other side of the river, while on the on the um, on the right side of the picture is the Kampung Baru area, which is a slightly underdeveloped area. However, uh, one of the one of uh, Tim Kyren's idea is that he wants to bridge these two because all the good foods, the good and cheap foods uh, in, in Kuala Lumpur can be obtained or can, can be acquired in Kampung Baru. So imagine um, having this river to cut across, uh, cutting across your path for lunch. Yeah. So it's a Malaysian thing. Malaysians need to go and have good lunch uh, every day. So. His idea, one of it, is actually to to bring these two uh, sides of the river closer together. So that's that's his uh, the simplest way I can put it. Uh, that that I, I understood his uh, his thesis right now. Uh, however, um, I think uh, Kairen, what we what we spoke about is the conflict between that and the whole idea of having. Uh, to to bring the river alive because what you're doing is just bridging these two uh, these two gaps yeah because uh, we are looking at the river as a problem because it is uh, an element of separation between these two spaces uh, at the same time your building is trying to bring the river uh, to, trying to celebrate the river yeah so at the moment um, I think we are at the point where we need to figure out how to bring these two together. Yeah, Karen. So I believe this is uh, what he's trying to do. And I just reiterated uh, our discussion from the previous uh, previous few days. Yeah. So that's my take. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Azari. All right. Can we have Dr. Tim Barwell for comments Hi. and suggestion? Yep. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the presentation thing. Um, I think what, what I'm interested in with your project is um, how you might question the, the edge of the river. You know, the, the river appears from the photographs that I've seen that you've showed that it, as it runs through the city, 
it almost is ignored by the city. It's almost this kind of concrete, sheer concrete sides on each side, presumably is an easy way to prevent kind of the levels. But what that does is, is appears to kind of separate the river from the city rather than celebrate the river from the city. And I'd question whether purely spanning the river celebrates it. I wonder if actually your project can start to challenge that edge and that edge condition and maybe even bring the river or part of the river into your landscape. I was really interested by the moves you were making in your landscape, the carving away of the ground and how you've removed the the kind of uh, this this barrier that it exists as the road that flies across the top and underneath so you're bringing people to the river but i think if your project is about this awareness of the river and the celebration of the river i think it, it would be fantastic to consider how you might bring the river into your project somehow so uh, i know at the moment you've got your kind of separate water tower that looks at the at the condition of the river but it feels like it could be done in maybe a, in, a, in a kind of passive way um, so that so that the people within your your building or in and around your your landscape can start to experience the level changes of the river you know the, these simple things and historically in a, in, a, in a landscape and the level change of the river has a huge impact on the surrounding area obviously through flooding and that's been uh, mitigated um, in, in many cities around the world. But could your landscape almost encourage, in part, the, the river to, to come in and, and to flood this area and to make uh, the participants, the people that are experiencing your, your building, actually how uh, a kind of more um, experiential way uh, of, of this river. And I think another, so I think that's that was my, my initial kind of uh, large thought about about the scheme and then I guess secondary um, I think it's also worth considering the kind of surfaces that you're using in your building and the materiality of your building because if we consider you know if we consider urban flooding for example you know often that is caused by torrential downpours and all of the hard surfaces and these impermeable surfaces running down into the infrastructure of the city and kind of flooding, you know, all at once the city. But, you know, I'd question, there's still quite a lot of hard surfaces in your building and in the landscape, you know, and, and are there other ways of, of making those a bit softer so they become sponges? So actually they show that that urban fabric can actually help with uh, with this issue of flooding that that many cities around around the world have to deal with, uh, and how they, that that those services might be experienced uh, as you uh, move through the building, and I guess that's my final point. Really, would be um, when you're inside your your building. We only had a couple of views, so I, I might be I might be incorrect here, but my feeling was that there was still quite a separation from the river and the landscape that you're creating when you're within the building. So I wonder if, if this translation, this transition from building to landscape to the river can really start to, to overlap, can start to, you can start to experience the river by bringing it into your site and likewise the building into your landscape. So it's kind of bridging in that way a little bit more as well. They're my, they're my thoughts. All right. Uh, thank you, team. Uh, is that all? Okay, um, all right. Yep, yep. Okay, I think, uh, shall we move to the next participant? All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tim Barwell, for the comments and the suggestion. Uh, thank you, Tim Kyron, thank for the you. presentation. All right, so next, I would like to welcome our participant from DMU, Hannah Bird, with the project titled Dystopia Land Use. The project is a livable landfill landscape to help reinstate the community with healthy and eco-friendly means of living. So, Hannah, you may take the stage now. Hi. Hi. I'm just going to share my screen. We've not got a presentation. We've got like a pin-up board, so I will share that with you.
Okay, can you see the screen okay? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, can see Okay. Screen. Perfect. So I'll take you around my board. Um, so my um, studio brief for this year, based on my unit, was that we were meant to look at land use and how humans um, use land, how they've used land in the past from early, the earliest settlements up until how we use land now and how uh, what our relationship is with, with the earth. So um, based on that, my project um, is, is in the UK. It's in North Nottinghamshire, which is about here on the map. And it's in north, the north of North Nottinghamshire. You can see it on there. That's the county. Um, so the site is an area of 1.2 square miles of land with a ring of small to medium sized villages around it, which you can see surrounding here. And this is the site. It's a rather large site and I'm going to just be tackling this area here a bit. So the history of site is that it was originally farmland in the 1890s. And then in um, along with World War II, it became a royal ordnance factory where they created cordite and acid for the for ammunitions. So that's some pictures of the cordite being produced. Cordite says uh, smoked was propellant and it's extremely explosive. So there's quite a lot of contamination on the site. Um, following that use, it was it was derelict and then demolished and demolished quite irresponsibly. So a lot of the cordite and acid was leaked into the soil, which has rendered the site unusable now for anyone else. So in 2004, the site was de was um, chosen for landfill. So on the north half of the site, there is now a domestic landfill, which has since been completely finished and capped. So in 2020, it was capped and now it's going to be green space. Um, so my research has been surrounding scars on a landscape and how humans have been detrimental to the natural world. So move over here. Yeah, how humans have been detrimental to the natural world through the wider effects of war, through human conflict, to our relationship with waste <clears throat> and the use of landfill. One piece of research which has really struck a chord with me is that in the UK every day we produce enough waste to fill the top of Trafalgar Square up to the top of Nelson's column. So that's like a huge amount of waste. That's just in one day. You can sort of see by this diagram how much waste that is. Um, so to further my research, I read the novel The Drowned World by J.G. Ballard, which is um, focused on the year 2145, where all the ice caps have melted and the sun has become so hot that most of the Earth's population have moved to the North Pole. The sea levels have also risen by 35 metres, which floods most of Europe and a lot of the UK. This study has influenced my collages, which I'll show you now, which I've used to um, inform my, well, I've used to dissect my knowledge and my understanding of this novel and how this could relate to my project. So this first one here is about humans' relationship with nature and how we see ourselves as separate from nature and how our version of nature is we'd prefer it to be a manicured, perfectly arranged gardens rather than the wild, which you see behind here. Um, the second one is the mirror image of the first one, which is focused on the other side of it, where we are so focused on our built environment and how that shows our worth and separates us from nature and puts us above animals. Um, the third one is about how if this, if we continue like this, we will probably be left with just trash and these are meant to be the towers of establishment which would crumble around us because there's nothing left. If, if we destroy our planet, then we can't survive basically. Then the next one is about how once we get to this point, nature will reclaim the earth. So it will rise the tide so that the earth floods so we can't survive. The sun will become so hot that we, we can't survive. We'll get cancers, we'll get too ill. We won't be able to survive in that heat. And um, yeah, basically nature will take over again. And then the final collage is about how when the waters rise and sun gets too hot, what if all that we're left with is the mounds of landfill that we created with our trash and our wasteful habits. So. This is a person stood on top of a man with fill and everyone else is fleeing to get there as well to try and save themselves from the floods. So following that, um, come over here. my research um, has had two lines of thought, the now and the future of the site. And therefore, my programme has developed as a study of a 125 year timeline 
um, following the, the events of the Drowned Wild by Jodie Ballard, um, from now until 2145, when the area my site sits on in this scenario would be flooded by 35 metres. So initially, my scheme will be used to implement more reuse and recycling on the site to help teach the community more about living in a less wasteful way and about their responsibility to the planet. The site is able, due to the contamination in the soil and what sits there now, to take on the waste from three other small landfill sites that are also in the county, which is here. So it would actually save. So this is the current landfill that's now full on the site. This is another one nearby and then two other ones nearby, which could be saved from being landfill sites and used as green space um, and returned to nature if we took on the landfill and used it to build more mounds on the site. So um, obviously this will save the, the people who live in that area from this process and those, apps, those sites would be capped and greened. So I propose, I'm just going to go here. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I propose two new mounds which will sit on the site to the south of the current landfill. Um, let's sign up here again. Um, yeah, so this is the current landfill. And then these are the two new mounds I would propose on the site, which are in the contaminated areas. Um, with the amount of waste taken onto this site from the three other landfills, the two new mounds could be built in just eight years. With the methane gases being constantly removed and stored or burnt for energy, landfill will not smell or create any harmful substances to the environment or the humans that live nearby. For five years following this, the landfill will settle and shrink to its most likely final size and shape. Following this five year period, the mound will be safe to use. So to be able to build on a landfill, um, there would need to be um, piling and stilts going down to the ground to add um, structure. So I've proposed a silt system, which will be put in place from before the landfill is even laid, made of recycled concrete and partially the partially hollow stilts will be formed through 3D printing. And the concrete itself is resistant to the processes which break down the trash in the landfill and will also be coated to prevent any porosity, which um, could allow leachate from the um, from the landfill, which is the liquids that come from um, breaking down trash. Um, it'll stop that from entering these stilts and keep them secure and safe. Um, once the landfill is capped, a special system to prevent damage to the and groundwater entry will be applied to the top and the local area will be ready. The village will then begin construction. So I've developed a bloom structural system, which I'll show you here. So I was looking at what could sit on top of the stilts. So I've decided to go with this sort of system. This loads. I don't think this drawing is loading very well. So. I'll zoom into this one so you can see a bit better. Um, okay, so I've proposed a bloom system which will um, support the village and the buildings that are needed to um, have a village. So not just houses, but shops and so on. Um, and it, this is inspired by Heatherwick's Pier 55 in New York. And I'm currently expanding the design of this to be more original to my project, which you can see on the other drawings. Um, the village will appear to float above the top of the mound um, as the um, as the soaring temperatures in this climate would require there to be a shaded area for green space, recreation, and also to grow and protect crops from the sun. Um, so this will happen atop the mound itself, so below this um, these blooms, but above the mound. Um, I'm currently in the process of developing a typology for the houses and the buildings that will sit there. Um, and I'm doing this for exploring form, light and shadow, the climate, materiality and the local built typology. So you can see those drawings here. These are, sorry, it's so blurry. Um, these are the, what I'm developing at the moment and trying to get an idea of how the actual homes will function and um, be designed. So I'm also exploring currently the arrangement of the village that will sit on top of the mound. So I've been looking at natural patterns, for example, Fibonacci, um, the Fibonacci sequence and spirals, also honeycomb. And I've also been looking at Voronoi patterns um, like this one on this leaf and um, having a look at how that can create like an organic feel to how the village will be arranged on top of the mound. So these are some drawings exploring that and how it would look in 3D. Um, this is a render of 
the landscape once it's flooded because the land is very flat at the moment so to increase to add these like these mounds of landfill will create a more varied landscape and somewhere for refuge and safety from the flood water um yeah that's where i'm at at the moment okay thank you hannah thank you, thank you. Hannah, for the interesting board presentation all right uh now it's time for q a session can we have dr tim barwell for comments and suggestions. Yeah, hi there. Hi, Anna. Thanks for that. Um, Thank you. I think um, I think I've, I've written a couple of things down, and I think the first thing is to you're talking about a long time frame that you're working with. So I think it would be really useful for you to explore how you describe that very clearly. That time frame, what happens in day one? You know, what happens after a uh, a number of kind of key thresholds in your in your project um, so we can understand because uh, I assume there will be a a changing of the landscape but also a changing of the structures that you're proposing um, and yeah. I wonder uh, whether a, maybe a kind of sectional drawing or a, an isometric a sectional isometric might be a way of, of showing that over time and really there are lots of kind of processes involved uh, in in your in your uh, architecture that I think need to be made visible. I mean, such mm -hmm. as you know the bring you know, initially the kind of bringing of the waste, that sorting of the waste, and understand what happens to the different types of waste, and then what waste actually goes into your into your ground. Um, and I think it's it was. Um, I think that the beginning of the the structures that you're starting to, to look at are, are very interesting um but i think again there's a for me i think they all show what's happening above ground and i think your project is a lot about the the kind of the the earth the waste and i think it would be great to to kind of extend that down and to understand what's happening underground you know what's the nature of this ground how does that change and how does your architecture start to embed with that underground so uh, in, in putting across the ideas of your project there's a kind of evolution yeah above ground there's an evolution of the people that that are living there and are engaging with the site that will change but there's also this change of relationship to what's happening beneath the ground um, and i think that's just just as important in, in your idea and you can start to draw you know you can start to draw this waste that you're talking about and and over that kind of time frame you can start to explore what happens to organic material what happens to inorganic material you know and, and if those could be embedded in the drawing and in the work it's another it's another way of of, of highlighting you know certain materials that, that that probably won't you know certain materials will become organic and become part of this this, this cycle um, and back into nature and then there'll be other materials that probably don't change at all over the time frame that you're talking about in your building and that's yeah. key to to capture i think and key to to highlight um because certainly for a kind of a thesis and you, you're trying to to set a, a question and make people aware of a certain scenario with your project so i think that that needs to be integrated in, in into the project Yes, definitely. Um, and they they were my and and it, I guess the final thing would be as um, showing more about the experiential side of how these how people interact with your architecture. I think. Um, yeah. So they're, they're they're my they're my comments. Thank you very Thank much, Dr. Tim. Okay, can we have our UTM panel, Mr. Azari? Hi. Hi. Um, hi, Hannah. Uh, it is hi. a very, very interesting uh, idea that you are exploring. Um, personally, I love this sort of uh, futuristic look at uh, architecture, think, trying to imagine uh, what's going to happen in the future. Um, I mean, I love science fiction. This is basically something that I've been trying to push my students to go for, but they don't read as much. <laughs> so it's uh, 
it's refreshing for me to actually see uh, this kind of work. Um, so um, you're trying to explore um, the world uh, 125 years in the future where uh, most of the world is flooded. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think based on from a bit based on your uh, presentation, uh, what I can just understand is you're trying to depict this this 125 year uh, in the future where people have to move uh, more towards the inlands, uh, and your proposal is to actually have some of the areas filled with um, rubbish, is it? Yeah, so waste, waste. <laughs> waste. Yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, with waste. So uh, I kind of like the idea, but um, I think like what Dr. Tim Bauer uh, mentioned just now, what's going to happen in between that time? So um, we know that you have an idea that you're going to have this uh, village built on top of these uh, landfills, but how how does it work? Um, I mean, how does how do you bring this waste into the landfill and then eventually get people to live in the area while it is a landfill? So, uh, because I would imagine that uh, it's not going to be some, some project that you're going to construct and then after it is done, then only people move in. Because from from your idea, the the whole world is getting flooded bit by bit. So people will be moving uh, inwards, inland, um, bit by bit. You know. So yeah. So how how does that work? Do you have you imagined this this part? Yeah. So um, it'll be over a, a timeline, obviously. So that's how I'm going to explore yeah. my drawings um onwards. But it'll basically be so um I've got a timeline over here. So. Um, from the present day, once the um, landfill, obviously no one will inhabit it while it's a natural landfill because it wouldn't be in it would be unsanitary. So um, that will be actually all laid within eight years. So once it's um, all laid, it'll turn into green space, and then up until the point where it will be um, used for a um, for the purpose of a village, if people were to move up there, sort of thing. Um, which will be starting to be built around, I think I've said 2070, it'll, it'll be in progress. Um, up until that point, it'll be used as a green, spray, a green space, it'll be landscaped and used to help people um, to reflect on how they're using the world. So there'll be like quite meditative spaces, which I'm going to design. And also um, on site, there'll be these recycling centers, which will be recycling um, building materials such as concrete, which actually can't break down in landfill. So I'm going to use a process where it's broken apart using um, electricity and water. Um, and then that that will create the materials that will then be used to make the villages. So this this recycled concrete will then be be 3D printed. So all those processes will be happening in that sort of in between stage. And as people start to migrate up onto the mound, so this I've worked out a sort of um, an order in which the villages will flood based on where they are and the ground height. So um, some of them flood before others and those people, as they move up there, will be taught the processes, how to how to use the 3D printers, how to build the blooms, how to build the buildings. And this community will sort of grow itself and they'll prepare for the next people to move up sort of thing. Uh, OK, so basically you're trying to to um trying to imagine what happens to this particular community, which is, I assume, yeah. situated nearby. So you're trying yes. to address them. Ah, I see. Okay. Because right yeah, now, so the I, community. I, I'm trying to imagine, because let's imagine the entire UK, right? So you have your government, you have all these other small, uh, the, 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 other, the rest of the community in the UK, and everybody yeah. will be, you know, running away from the water, from, from the sea, the, yes. the rising sea. So. Um, I was just thinking that, I mean, imagine a group of uh, people, you know, uh, who thinks they are very important in the country trying to buy land on your particular mm. side instead of yeah. uh, the people immediately surrounding it. And this would create some sort of conflict. It would make a great movie uh, trying to <laughs> imagine, yeah. imagine that happening. So I yeah, think that's yeah. that's very, very, very interesting um, exploration. I just hope that... Um, uh towards uh, this is to uh, in uh, sorry how do i word this uh, this is still early in your studies isn't it um yeah well i've got a few months left okay so i hope some uh, when you decide 
uh, to finalize this. Um, it probably much more be, be much more interesting to depict a particular time, maybe around seventy years in the future instead of one hundred and twenty-five, because I think one hundred and thirty-five okay. is probably the end. Sorry, the the end of the timeline. Yeah. Uh, just thinking of that, but as an architect, we're trying to imagine what might happen and how do you deal with that uh, in between those time between now and and 125 years in the future so i think somewhere around 50 to 75 years in the future yeah. would be a great uh, great time for you to show off your your architecture and ideas that's that's just my opinion yeah, yeah i agree completely i think that would work best because you're able to see it developing and see the community actually using it before the the water is at its highest point so i think that would work really well all right. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Brilliant. All thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Azari. And thank you to Hannah for, for your presentation. All right. Now it's the time for our third participant from UTM, uh, Anaf Samsuri, with the project title uh, Parametric Office. The project aims to reduce energy usage while enhancing its performance through parametric facade in order to address global warming and to reduce carbon foot footprint. So enough, you may take the center stage now. You can share the your screen right, right now. Anna, we cannot see your slide. Okay. Hello, good. Uh, Okay. All right. Hello. Uh, good evening and good morning to all lecturers and fellow students from the Manford uh, University. Actually, there is uh, some error in the poster uh, for my title, my thesis, my pre thesis title, uh, which is uh, the real, my, my pre thesis title is about co recreational office hub in Penang. So, uh, this is the, my thesis title. Uh, so this uh, co recreational office hub uh, provide a creative co-working space and rental office for local entrepreneur and this will be focusing on how to optimize uh, daylight performance into working area by exploring the design potential of skylight roof buffer and other daylight strategies. So I start with my I start my design with uh, with the issue. There are three main issues that I look into. The first one is uh, too much daylight can lead to excessive glare. The second one is uh, intensive solar heat gain, and finally is uh, works, workspace that had no natural daylight uh, or grade three reported higher level of sickness, less productivity, uh, less motivation, and less creativity. Uh, so from the issue, I generated my research aim and objective. Uh, my research aim is to design a co-recreational office hub that optimizes daylight performance. Uh, and promotes physical wellness among the workers. And the objective are uh, to identify the issue and solution for the daylighting of office building in, the, in Malaysia. And the second one is to identify the design characteristic of Skylight Buffer that can improve the lighting performance. And the final one is to evaluate Skylight Buffer design that can optimize the lighting performance in, into office building using simulation software. So this is the front view of my building, uh, this view uh, from, from the roundabout. So the design concept for my project is uh, reconnect. Uh, I want to reconnect three design principles, evolving space, humans, uh, and nature, and to implement this principle into working and recreational environment, as well as community space. Uh, this is the site introduction. Uh, my site is located on the east coast of Pinay Island. Uh, with total land area about 1.7 acres. Uh, this, this site also uh, part of phase two of like, uh, the light development by IJM Corporation Berhad. Uh, it's strategically located on the main highway, which is Liburaya, Liburaya Tun, uh, Tun Dr. Lim Chung Yu. Uh, it's only 10 minutes away from the Georgetown and 15 minutes away from, from the Penang International Airport. Uh, today, the first one is already done, which is the residential, the, uh, which is the, the residential, and then now is the construction, the phase two, which is water site resident and the light city. After that, they will continue uh, the business district, uh, the which uh, my site is located, and the final phase is the phase three, which is the sea front park. 
So there, uh, there are various landmarks that can spot can be spotted around the site. Uh, unfortunately, there is no landmark. Uh, uh, there, there is no landmark that serve as recreational area nearby, uh, nearby the site. So currently, the nearest spot in the Bukit, uh, the nearest spot of uh, recreational area is uh, Bukit Duma, which is around fifteen minutes away. So the idea of proposing a co-recreational office hub uh, in the site. Uh, is is a good idea because it can serve the nearby community and especially the light residents. Uh, then I I start with my uh, my design with the site planning. Uh, the first one is uh, site view. Uh, my site is located uh, beside the sea, uh, beside the sea, so the building frontage should be maximize the sea view. The second one is private and public. Uh, so it can define it can it, uh, are defined according to the site context. So as you can see, the private zone is facing the future business district, and public zone is facing to the future sea front park and also the the sea view. The next one is connectivity, uh, which is uh, to connect all the potential site uh, contact into the building. Next one is a landscaping, uh, which is I introduce the courtyard in the middle of in the middle of my building. And then is about uh, and, and then is accessibility. Service access is located at the private zone, and it's separated by it's separated from the main ingress and egress. And then the final one is grid and order. Uh, so the site grid is is based on the site context and maximizes the site benefit. So this is the front view of uh, front view of my building. After done with the site planning, I developed my design with the design mixing development. The first, um, my the first uh, development is I start with the site mixing, uh, with long north and south facade and short uh, east and west facade, and then I split uh, to the mixing to create a green courtyard uh, in the plaza to bring the daylight into the building. Uh, the next one is I created space uh, between the block to improve the air ventilation and make uh, the building uh, more permeable. Uh, the next one is I create hierarchy of my scene to maximize the sea view. And then I introduce the skylight on the plaza to the, the, the direct sunlight. And the final one is I within the plaza entrance to create a sense of welcoming. So this is the view of Green Plaza. So this is, uh, I, these are the key plan, location plan and site plan of the project. As you can see, uh, the site plan is showing the existing nearby context and also the future nearby context. This is the typical basement floor plan. Uh, this building need to provide around 300 car parks and also 300 motorcycle parks uh, based on local authority guidelines. Uh, this is my ground floor plan. Uh, there are two blocks in the in this building, and it's separated by the green courtyard. And uh, in front of this building, also there is a green pal green plaza to attack to attract the people into into my building. And uh, this is the draw off, and there is this is the reception lobby. It integrated with the cafe, and at a, another side of the uh, another side of the block, there is a recreational facility. For example, like uh, outdoor gym, uh, studio, and also uh, indoor gym. And then there's there is also management office and also some of the services area. Uh, so next is uh, my first floor plan. Uh, for the first floor plan, there is a jogging and a pedestrian path. And they connected with the nearby context, uh, so the people from the outside can also come into the building uh, using this path, and then go into my into my building. This is this is the typical floor plan uh, floor plan for the working area. There is a working area. Uh, there is a co working area, uh, and then there is like a rental office unit. And in the between of this uh, block, there is uh, like a pocket space uh, for the people to hang out. This uh, for the fifth and sixth floor plans. Uh, it, it is only for the rental office units, and some some of the area is uh, for the service area. This is the Alfres Alfreses Alfresco area uh, for the cafe that integrated with the reception lobby. These are the elevation view. This is the facade view. Uh, 
uh, these are the section showing the spaces in the building and how it connect with uh, each other. This is the sectional perspective uh, showing how the skylight uh, roof buffer filter the, the uh, filter the sunlight into the building. Then the green courtyard uh, diffuse the uh, the daylight into the office area. This is the green courtyard. This is the exploded ozonometric uh, showing the internet space of my building and showing how the the, the, the spaces connect uh, connected with each other. And then this is uh, the uh, community space. Uh, so from the pedestrian and jogging park, so they come in into, into my building and they uh, they meet up at, the, at this community space. This is uh, the scarlet roof buffer details. Uh, for the for this uh, detail, for the, the, for the scarlet roof buffer, there is five uh, main material that I use. The first one is polycarbonate roof. The second one is uh, aluminum shape for the roof buffer. And then the next one is uh, CSS steel column. And then it's supported by steel framing and also MS tapered B framing. Uh, this is the modular, uh, modular lecture detail. So uh, there are uh, three components. The, the first one is the wood shading panel. And then the second one is composite facade panel. And then the final one is a uh, low heat glass window. This is the light chef development. Uh, there is like three design that I experiment with uh, simulation software. So I take uh, the, the 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 one uh, the design that showing the best uh, the best uh, result of simulation. So this is the daylight simulation. I have uh, two uh, sim uh, simulation study. The first one is highlight of buffer study. And this one is a uh, light shape study. So this is the daylight simulation one, which is the skylight of buffer study. The first experiment is uh, is uh, there is no skylight I, I, I did. So this is the, the variable. There is constant variable, uh, independent variable, and dependent variable. So the independent variable is the skylight buffer design. So for this one is no skylight buffer. And the dependent variable is illuminance. So basically, I need to uh, achieve the illuminance around 300 to 500 lux. So for this experiment, uh, high lux level in the foyer can be uh, can be seen, and it can cause the intolerable glare and uncomfortable thermal comfort. And also, the lux in the office area is uh, acceptable, but it only covers uh, covered one side of the building. This is the, the, the second uh, experiment, which is scarlet buffer design one. Uh, this design is, is a vertical element perpendicular, perpendicular to building orientation. The distance between the buffer is uh, one meter and the depth of, uh, of the buffer is one meter. So uh, the constant variable, the, the variable is same with uh, the first one. So basically the, uh, the synthesis uh, is the high level, high lux level at the PM in the foyer area can cause interrogable glare and uncomfortable comfort and the lux level at uh, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. are accept acceptable because of the skylight buffer diffuse the direct sunlight and the lux level in the office area uh, which is this is acceptable but it only cover one side of the building so I need to uh, so be, uh, after that I, I need to uh, propose like chef or opening and then for another side. Next one is Skylight Buffer Design Group, uh, which is a vertical element uh, rotated 45 degree uh, perpendicular to the building orientation. So the distance and depth of the buffer is same, which is one meter. And then uh, the synthesis, uh, the lux uh, level uh, at 9 a.m., 12 p.m. and uh, 3 p.m. are acceptable in the foyer area. Uh, and also the lux level in the area is acceptable, but it only cover for one side of the of the building blocks. So I need to propose like chef or opening. So this is the final uh, final scalar buffer design. So it is a uh, combination of vertical element, a vertical element parallel to the orientation and also vertical element rotated 45 degree perpendicular to the building orientation. So the distance, the distance also one meter and the depth also one meter. 
So the synthesis, uh, uh, the the lux level at under the slide is acceptable, and the uh, but the lux level at uh, for 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. are too dark because of uh, too many plane for the starlight uh, buffer. So I need to like uh, reduce the 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 number of the plane. <laughs> And then after that, uh, the lux level in the office area at 12 p.m. is acceptable, but it only uh, also cover one side only of the block. But I need I need to propose a uh, light shape or opening for another side of the building. So basically, uh, the scarlet buffer design two and design three is uh, recommended. So from this design, I try to uh, develop into my design. I will integrate with integrated in, integrate these two design into. In my design into my proposed design. Next one is the light simulation two, which is light shape. Uh, the first light shape is uh, I experimented. Uh, this is the constant variable, the independent variable and independent variable. So the the independent variable is light shape angle, which is this. For this one, uh, the angle is ninety degree. So the uh, the result showing uh, quite acceptable, but there is some part is uh, a bit high, around 600 to 700. 700. The next uh, one is light shape 2. Uh, this is a uh, light shape angle, uh, 15 degree upward outside, which is this. And then the result a bit high. So uh, I need to uh, use around 600 to 700 also. And then the final light like, shape is uh, 15, uh, 15 degree upward, uh, which is inside. So this, uh, the result is a bit, uh, is very acceptable because it around uh, 300 to 500, uh, which, uh, which are the acceptable plane for illuminance. So after that, from the, the from the two experiments, the skylight and also the roof, uh, the, the skylight roof buffer and then the light like, shape, I combine into the overall uh, simulation. This is uh, for the second floor plan. As you can see, the uh, there's uh, for the area under the skylight is uh, uh, at nine a.m. and three p.m. Uh, under the skylight is acceptable. And the last one more minute, yeah, one okay. more minute. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the last level area, area and last level in the office area are also acceptable. And then uh, this one also for the fog, uh, fog plan also is showing that uh, area in the in the courtyard, the last level is uh, a bit high, but it is okay because under the skylight is only the landscape and outdoor, so it's okay for the last level a bit higher. But for the office area is very acceptable. This is also for the uh, sick plan. The result also quite acceptable in the in the office area. So this is summary of my daylight strategies. Uh, I use three uh, strategies. The first one is skylight roof buffer. The second one is light shape class design. And then the final one is uh, green coyote. So this is the front view. So I end my pre presentation with my uh, animation.
Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Anaf. So, can we have Mr. Azari for comment and suggestion? Hi, Anaf. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, your focus for this study is mainly on the environmental aspects of the uh, office, correct? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, having uh, gone through quite detail on the uh, how your building responds to the environment and so on, I'm actually much more particular about your your building uh, intent uh, because. Uh, I believe the title of your thesis is Co-Recreational Office Hub in Penang. So I think one of the things you should uh, uh, elaborate on is on that particular aspect rather than the environment part. I mean, I do get the, the how, how your building respond to the environment, to the, to the sun and so on. But I'm particularly curious uh, on this Co-Recreational Office Hub. How, how do you go about, I mean, what happened to the user? What what are the new things that you're contributing uh, in this particular design? Can you elaborate on that one? Uh, that one, uh, yeah. Sorry. So for the core recreation of this hub, uh, I try to uh, the I try to put the recreation recreation uh, area. At the ground floor plan, the ground floor, and also the first floor plan, so it only like cater for the for the residents and also the all the community nearby. So basically, when people want to come to the into my uh into my building, the space uh, the area uh, uh I mean the zone for the recreational area is only the for the ground floor plan, and also uh at the first floor plan. After uh, first floor plan at uh, to uh, second floor plan and uh, upper, it, it will be the all the uh, working space. So basically, uh, this uh, pedestrian and jogging path also like connected uh, at the at the first floor at the first uh, floor plan. So the people uh, if they the, the people want to uh, use uh, the facility in this building, they can use also this uh, jogging path and pedestrian path to come into my office and use. Uh, these uh, facilities in my building. So basically, uh, that's uh, this is for the recreational part of my building. Okay, um, I think uh, what I'm trying to to suggest is that um, maybe you might want to explore this a little bit further because at the moment in your building you have about a four or five story building, and you separated um, the office part and the recreation part quite quite distinctly because the office is only occupied on the upper floors and your recreation restaurant and all the other event spaces are on the on the lower part. I think uh, there is an opportunity here because your idea at first is talking about co-recreational office. So I'm immediately thinking of instead of having uh, an office where you know there is a basketball court on, on the ground floor, imagine having your office on, on the same floor of the basketball court or inside the basketball court itself. So that would be, I mean, the basketball court, of course, is a bit uh, out there. So maybe you might want to find uh, a more interesting space uh, like game rooms and so on. So imagine, imagine Google Office or I think there are lots of, um, you know, uh, offices designed for young uh, entrepreneurs and that, that kind of stuff. So where you have all these uh, elements um, merged together rather than having it on separate floors. You see, because I think on the environment part, you got the science down. I mean, you have no problem on the science part. It's just trying to make the architecture part. How is this building different from all the other uh, office uh, complexes? So your idea is now trying to talk about, or trying to sell this whole idea of recreational office spaces you know so having your your uh, office right in the middle of some landscape area that is very beautiful or imagine having an office with a huge screen where you can play Netflix all day long while everybody enjoying movies and so on while working or something like that so that's that's what I imagine I'm trying to to, to give you an idea yeah so I think that's from me thank you thank you Mr. Azar. Thank you very much, Mr. Azari.
can we have our DME panel, Dr. Tim Barwell? Any comments? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, I agree. You, you've obviously, um, you know, enjoyed and really gone into a lot of detail in in terms of the technical resolution, which is which is great. Um, and I think I think now what you need to consider is so so the kind of uh, You've, you've looked at, at, at the kind of quantifiable elements of it. Now I want to understand the kind of experiential part of your building. You know, actually, it, it feels like you've tried to, um, it feels like you've accepted the kind of traditional or the existing uh, format of an office and then tried to optimize that. And I think there's an opportunity with your project to really question that question you know what an office is what an, what an office space is and earlier on in your project you talked about a kind of combining trying to bring together space the occupiers and the natural environment um, and i find that really interesting i find that fascinating in the sense of um does it is it, is it the case that there might be a series of spaces within your building that don't require to be internal or external, but maybe kind of exist somewhere be between the two. Um, so you start to use the things you've got on site. I assume because you're next to water. I mean, I mean, I don't know the site, but I assume because you're next to the sea or next to water, there's there's a uh, there's there's a breeze from that. There's a kind of uh, direction of of breeze coming from that. You know, is there any way that your building and your spaces can start to capture that and funnel that? So actually, um, you're kind of utilizing the layout of the architecture to mean that and maybe that's not the office spaces themselves. You know, maybe uh, an office space in that environment still does need to be uh, have an element of, of active cooling. But maybe the kind of passive elements, such as the circulation space, such as the spaces that you're only in momentarily or you're transiting through, you know, what about if they become nicer spaces, passively nicer spaces to be than being outside? And, you know, how might your, 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 your architecture funnel kind of any breeze that you've got and highlight that breeze so that walking down some of your uh the avenues in your building become this kind of refreshing element and how might you also start to use nature a bit more in as a kind of i'm interested in your project almost as a a kind of series of layers that's that's how it feels to me you you presented it as a kind of series of filtered layers and i wonder whether you can use planting as that kind of first layer you know in terms of a uh, creating some of the environments that you're talking about. That's, and that's what comes back to uh, looking at the experiential part of your building, you know. Um, what's it like to be in your office spaces? What are you, what are you looking out on? What are the different options for um, creating a kind of dappled light, you know, rather than necessarily it just being a, a, a fixed light? Can it be, can it be? I, I mean, I understand that that uh, you're you're quite close to the equator down there, so there's not necessarily extreme seasons, but there are kind of connections with the outside and with and with nature that maybe it would be great for your building to start to respond to. You know, it feels like you're in a in a good position to really push that now, in in that you've got a kind of uh, a layout that you can start to play with and start to almost carve out of and hack around and kind of introduce these elements and really look at it from the other way around. So go into your office space and, and, and start to explore, right, what it's like, what's it like to be in an office space? And there's, there's, there's lots of research that talks about the benefits of um, nature uh, in terms of, you know, it, for example, uh, is, is it important for your office spaces to be intertwined within an outdoor walk? that might have a lot of nature in it so that because often you know there's no need when you, if you're on a conference call if you're on a phone there's no need for you to be in the office you can be walking around you know that the health benefits of standing up the health benefits of walk, walking around in activity in an office environment are really exciting and um and i and i think um 
making the most of that incredible i mean i imagine this building has got an incredible view out to sea you've not shown us but i think you know from from the site plan it looks like it's got this incredible view so how how can some of these office spaces get access to that um uh, and and access to the breed that's coming off that and access to the nature that you can introduce into it and you might find that once you start to uh, interrogate these spaces and actually which spaces really need to be um kind of called actively um that there might be a lot more a lot less of them than 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 you're suggesting at the moment you know and actually they're kind of the 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 imprint the the the, the footprint the the kind of the carbon use of your of your building through its layout can be can be improved but more than that i think what i'm trying to say is that i think the experiment the, the experiential part and really encouraging people that out be, being being in this kind of interior outerior out uh, interior exterior part of your building can be more comfortable than being within these kind of hermetically controlled boxes you know and how might you challenge that and how might that the, the project develop in, in that way um because i think it's, it's a really kind of fascinating thing to look at and and, and likewise cross ventilation you know simple things such as cross ventilation how might you, your building start to encourage that within the spaces i can understand on the kind of grand move by opening up the central courtyard that you're you know potentially got this kind of cross ventilation but but in the individual spaces themselves how can they start to be to be laid out and and maybe the i think it's an interesting question you, you talk about um the kind of efficiency of these spaces well maybe um maybe it, it, it's looking at productivity rather than efficiency of space uh, and, in pro and, and, and if spaces like people can be more productive rather than me be, be more uh, kind of spatially efficient <laughs> it's a it's another way of challenging you know the, the amount of hours that you have to spend at work if during that time you're being more productive and the ways of being more productive are some of the things that potentially that you're touching on in your project in, in terms of the environment so I think really now do question that kind of traditional office space and what your brief sets out and how your brief your your setting yourself can challenge that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tim. Thank you very much, Dr. Tim Barwell, for the constructive comments. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anna, for the presentation. All right. I think we can move on. Next, I would like to welcome our last participant from DMU. Jan Moore, with the project titled Ruin Carnation State of Urbanicity. The project looks into urban rust belt as a new avenue for cohabitation while adopting sustainable systems for development. So uh, Jan, you may take the stage now. Jen, is everything all right? Hello, Jen. We are waiting on you. Jen, hello. Uh, I think you need to unmute yourself first because we can see your your screen. 
Maybe you can see the unmute button on the top of your screen. It's hidden. It's the, the ribbon is hidden. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfectly. Oh, okay now. Sorry, there was problems with oh, I'm getting an echo in my ear now. All right. Okay, Jen, you missed right. that now. Okay. So so I'm getting an echo in my ear, it's really hard to talk. I'm just going to try and join the meeting again. I'm really sorry for this. Um, I can see that there are two instances of your account, Yan. Um, okay. you, you might need to quit one of it. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, brilliant. So, sorry about that. To start with, uh, hi everyone, I'm Jan. My project hi. is called Urban uh, Re Reincarnation. So, a little bit about our unit brief to start off with. Um, our unit looks specifically at uh, patterns of urbanization in the UK's post-industrial cities, and it looks to propose new ways of inhabiting and systematically designing with an aging infrastructure. So my project specifically looked at the contemporary issues uh, resulting from the global pandemic and from the UK leaving the European Union, uh, which I look at as a sort of global metamorphosis, which we need to take advantage of and see as a catalyst to change in order to live more sustainably. Um, so as a result of these specific changes, uh, we're beginning to experience counter urbanization, which is the movement of people away from cities in back into rural areas. Um, and uh, a tendency to become more self-sufficient as a nation uh, as a result of Brexit. Um, so this year in January, we've seen the biggest monthly dec decline in British trade for over 20 years uh, as, a, as a result of uh, the global pandemic and of Brexit. Uh, so in response to these issues, I'm looking to the UK's uh, forgotten uh, sites, uh, the UK's uh, urban rust belt, um, I'm looking specifically at Stoke-on-Trent, uh, an area with a, of a rich industrial history. And my project essentially looks at the specific processes needed to rehabilitate, rehabilitate these uh, post-industrial sites uh, in order to prepare them for habitation. Um, so, this is the area of Stoke-on-Trent. I've identified a number of industrial sites which are disused, uh, no longer in use, uh, which this sort of my project could be uh, in implemented on. Uh, I've chosen Chatterley Whitfield, which is a disused colliery, uh, an incredibly comprehensive site and one that's been quite well preserved. Uh, so part of these processes to prepare these sites for habitation. Uh, one of them is dealing with the natural decay on the site. So I've conducted uh, a line of research into building decay, uh, looking at uh, the specific materials on site, how they will decay. Uh, and then this research stemmed into the factors that you can control decay uh, and looking at a sort of arch architectural typology in which you could sort of control these factors which influence decay. Um, Another big aspect of utilizing these industrial sites, uh, after years of sort of mining and burning coal, the ground is uh, riddled with toxins, uh, which deems the site uh, unsuitable for 
the production of food. So I've conducted another line of research into phytoremediation, which is a bioremediary process in which you use plants to remove the toxins from the ground. And this is going to be done over a period of around 50 years. Uh, and so my project looks at sort of the circular economy and issues of sustainability. So I was looking at ways in which you could further utilize these plants. So one of the ways in which you could use them is for bioenergy. So after the crops have been used for the uh, phytoremediary process, you can burn them for bioenergy. So that brings the introduction of a, a bioenergy plant on the site, which sort of brings the site back to its uh, industrial roots. Um, I look specifically at the, the best plants to use uh, for the specific site of coal burning and coal mining and propose the plant, a yearly planting cycle in which you use these four main plants and then they're, they're, they're grown, harvested and then used for the production of bioenergy. Um, so in terms of the typologies on site, uh, they reflect directly the uh, existing structures which they're built over uh, and you, the, one of the primary typologies is this sort of greenhouse typology which stems back from the vivarium which is a sort of glass cage in which you can sort of better control the internal factors uh, inside so you can control the sort of the vegetation and the factors which influence decay um the project itself spans over a number of decades obviously with the fighter remediation process uh spanning at least 50 years um sorry computer's being a bit slow uh so i've proposed this project timeline and come up with these three main axo drawings which sort of show the site as three main stages so this is the site in its existing form um, and it shows the, the systems on site, so the coal mining, burning and transportation. Uh, this is the site proposed uh, 10 years from now, where you can see there's decay on site and then you have the intervention. So the bioenergy plant here and this construction warehouse from which the other buildings sort of grow. Um, and then the centre here, you have the visitor centre, which is being constructed. And then we look at the site in 2070, where this site is fully developed in the center, and then you're beginning to see the residential areas sprouting up around the outside. Um, and then some drawings which show the sort of design and circulation. Uh, so this shows the main typologies on site and the circulation around. Uh, and then here we look at a sort of micro level of how we interact with the existing and the proposed. So the sort of four main construction details, which show how we interact with the decay on site. And then at a more macro level, how this building sort of mirrors the existing forms. Uh, and then just some images of the different buildings on site, construction details. Uh, and then I just have a video to finish off with just as a walkthrough of the site. Uh, so this takes us in from the main entrance. You have this sort of reveal around the rewilding of the external of the site, uh, the construction warehouse to the right here. And then we move into the visitor center. So this building is the sort of the main point of contact for anyone visiting the site. Um, you'll be taken through, you can learn about the processes on site uh, and the rich sort of industrial heritage of the site. And here we have a, a model of the existing site. And then you're taken through the tropical greenhouse. Uh, this is on the existing part of this site at the moment is very overgrown and I didn't want to sort of take away from any of the existing vegetation. So you sort of build on top of that with this sort of vivarium typology. And you have the, the central 
public space. And you're taking down the staircase to the sort of main body of water over the site. Uh, this utilizes another um, branch of phytoremediation, which sort of helps heal the, the water sources on the site using uh, bio life. And in between the main buildings, you have a series of gardens and pools, and these pools themselves reflect the underground mines. So I've taken a plan of the underground mines and sort of used that to 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 show exactly where the, the landscape and the pools and the gardens are on top. Uh, this is the seed bank. So sort of the seed storage and the phytoremediation research is all taken care of in here. So you have offices and research areas for all the bioprocesses on the site. Okay, Janice. Mm -hmm. Done? Yep. Yep, you're done. Yeah, is the video playing on the screen? Uh, yeah, I cannot see that. I cannot see the video. No, okay. Are you sharing right now? Uh, yeah, I think so. Are you sharing the video right now? Because uh, I don't think you can see it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can't see Do you either. see the, the walkthrough of the presentation there? Yes. Okay. But but not the uh, do we have time for the video now? Sure. Yep. Uh, is it can you see it now? Uh, yep. All right. Okay, there you go. Apologies. Having a few technical if issues today. Okay, so this is where yeah, where you enter the site. The construction warehouse on the right. And then there, so you enter the visitor center here, the sort of main point of contact for people entering the site. So it's yet to be populated inside, but the idea of this building is uh, for people to come in and learn about the exact processes taking place on site and learn about the sort of industrial heritage which isn't something I really want to iterate uh, within the project, not forget the sort of industrial roots of the site. And so, yeah, you have the tropical greenhouse here in the middle and the sort of main public space within the center. And this central pool here. And yeah, you see the, the stepped gardens and the pools, which should occupy the spaces sort of in between the main structures. It's influenced a lot by the work of Carlo Scarpa, who was influenced by sort of Japanese Zen culture, creating this sort of calming, reflective, uh, public space in between the buildings. And here you come into the seed bank, you can see the sort of interaction between the new and the old structures. So this building is essentially an archive for all of the biological life on site. You have the office. And so sort of all of these buildings have a public public access. So although maybe there's areas which aren't suitable for a public, there will always be sort of observational walkways around. So even in the sort of bioenergy power plant, the construction warehouse, there's raised walkways so the public can see all of the processes taking place on site. So here we go into the construction warehouse. This is acts as a sort of anchor building for the project. So it's the first building constructed on site. And then here you sort of store and process all of the construction materials to build all of the other structures on site. On site.
then yeah we move back into the external area and a lot of the outside area is populated by these raised walkways as this sort of fighter remediation process is happening on the ground so a lot of the circulation is raised so you do not disturb the sort of plant life and then we move into the bioenergy power plant Uh, I'm quite happy to open it up to comments and questions now, just to carry on and let the, the, the video right. playing up. I'm probably running over time quite a bit now. <laughs> it's been too long. All right, uh, can we have Dr. Tim Barwell for comments? Dr. Tim? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Janice. Um, Hi. I mean, I think it's uh, it's a very th uh, thorough project, which is great, and you, you've you know, described it in a, in a number of different ways. I think my my feeling as you uh, presented the scheme that um, there's a careful chore choreography of these spaces that you're creating. But I think what I'm really interested to see on top of that is this kind of the aspects of living, the inhabitation, actually how people um, interact with your spaces and how you might communicate that. Because am I right in saying that it, it's a there's a community that you're that you're growing there? This is presented as a kind of a, an alternative to to urban living. It's it's a kind of that's uh, right. This sort ex industrial of, environment. The definitely the end goal is to have this site inhabited by a community. But I think the main project focus is the sort of preparation of the site to get to that stage. Right. So, but you will have you will, there will still be a community on there, even if they are the people that are living and working and, and building these and these uh, these structures. And yeah. I guess I'm interested in in how how the work might start to become inhabited and and what impact that occupation and that kind of inhabitation and the the daily routines really around around your building. Um, because uh, it's a kind of, and you, you know, purposefully so you've kind of, you've got this mixture of of existing remnants of buildings interacting with new, new uh, structures. Um, but the kind of um, how how they're used and and your your reasonings for for kind of positioning things in 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 certain locations and their relationships to each other. So it. The kind of cycle of of the spaces, um, you know, it it looks like it's very carefully considered, and it and it looks like the the transition between those and uh, and the kind of landscapes are very are very considered. But I want to know. I guess I want to know. I want you to explain through the work how 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 you see this this people interacting with this and how the different types of whether it be someone who's building one of the structures, whether it's it, it's a family that's living there, whether it's uh, the people that, that are working in, in, in certain parts of it. How how do they because it feels like it will bring it will bring another kind of life to the project for me. I think at the moment it it, it, it almost it feels a little bit like um, uh, a kind of a ruin that you might go and visit. <laughs> but mm -hmm. how do you inhabit have that? You know, and all of the other things that come along with that would be would be a question for me. And I think it's maybe it's not about trying to tackle everything that you've designed. Maybe it's t it's picking a kind of few key transitional spaces and, and areas and really digging deep into those, and really exploring them. So and I think that that work can also explore the uh, the materiality of it. I think there's only so far the kind of ren rendered and the uh, uh, the kind of fly through can show us that that materiality, and it would be great if if you start to explore that through 
through a, uh, a kind of a, a drawing or or maybe it's a model i don't know if, if you know it's obviously difficult to get access to certain mm -hmm. modeling materials but I, I i remember from your work last year you're a very talented model maker so maybe it's a kind of hybrid maybe it's a a hybrid drawing or model that can start to explore these moments uh, and, and and let us kind of understand how this thing is occupied and how and how nature starts to take over this thing you know you're describing it as kind of remediation which is a very kind of human controlled process mm. where you put the plantings planting here it, it kind of cleans the soil etc cetera, etc cetera. well how how does that kind of evolve how how does that turn into something more wild as this thing becomes more mature and and as i said i don't think it's a case of trying to blanket cover the whole scheme because I don't think you know that, that that's the best way of showing it. I think it's about choosing these moments and these and and buildings, but transition transitions from building to building, uh, and really digging into in, into those. And a new way, I think it for me, it wants to be a new way of exploring the project. So not one of the traditional, you know, one of the the methods you've used so far. I think that different grain will will bring us something different to the project. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tim Barwell. Uh, can we have Mr. Azari? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Um, Jan, is it? Jan. Um, yes. I think this is quite a great scheme. I really love it. This is totally um, something that I would do during my own study, yes. But I never had the opportunity because we are not allowed to do this kind of stuff. Uh, anyway, so I think one of the things that I'm uh, particularly interested about uh, trying to find out more from you, hopefully, um, uh, looking at your exonometric uh, drawing, stage 00, stage 01, and stage 02. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is looking at it in a timeline, isn't it? So what's going to happen on this particular site throughout a certain amount of years? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the one of the key thing that you mentioned just now is embracing decay, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, are you trying to say that you're going to deliberately allow certain part of your building to become dilapidated? Uh, is, is it what you're trying to say, or are you trying to just you know like uh, photograph a particular part of decay and then try to preserve it as it is? Uh, what are you trying to do actually? So there's a few different processes happening on site. In some areas, you're sort of letting nature take its course and letting letting the decay just happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then in some areas, you're sort of controlling it more closely. You're either speeding it up or slowing down the processes of decay. And a lot of it is just sort of in order to celebrate what is celebrate the existing and celebrate the industrial heritage uh, of the site uh, using these sort of different processes. I see. Um, is there any particular um, controlling factors uh, in, th in terms of determining which part should you just let it decay further or which part you should preserve now, that sort of thing? So this was part of some of the earlier research I conducted looking at the individual buildings on site. Um, so the site itself has evolved over about two centuries. Um, uh, it's grown and shrunk and so some of the buildings are a lot older, some of them not so old. Um, it's sort of it's determined from the hierarchy of what I've determined to be the importance of the buildings um, and their purposes, but um, there is there is some method to it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think it's a brilliant scheme. I love it. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Azari. Thank you, Jan, for the interesting presentation. All right. Um... I believe we have no question from the audience. Uh, so now we have come to the end of the session. All right. So uh, I would like to thank you again. Uh, and I would like to thank you, our panels, uh, especially Dr. Tim Barwell and, and of course, Mr. Azari. And thank you also to the participants uh, for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have you all with us. So basically, this concludes our colloquium. So we are from UTM hoping that our, that our collaboration doesn't end here and hoping that there is more to come between UTM and DMU. So thank you all for attending and uh, we conclude it now and we hope you have learned and enjoyed the session. So goodbye. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.